The UK Ports and Pilotage Authorities were alerted um, to this whole issue um, back in June uh, of this year by the Passenger Boat Association and uh, uh, various other organisations representing uh, professional um, boating uh, organisations, uh, people within, within the UK, a Professional Boatmen's Association, National uh, Work Boat Association, and the Company of Watermen and Lightermen, who had found out by, um, well, some means, uh, of this whole issue. Uh, we had not been, we, the maritime industry, maritime operating industry, had not been included in the consultation notice by the DFT, uh, they realised that they've made a fairly significant mistake um, and have apologised and, and we are now well in consultation with them. But when we found out about it, um, I was asked by my chief executive to look at the various issues, technical, operational, logistic issues uh, relating to um, this matter. Um, and make some recommendations. And why did I end up with it? Well, I, um, although the day job is a marine engineer for the PLA, I also act um, in consultation on environmental and maritime operations. Uh, I act as a representative on behalf of the UK ports and pilotage organizations uh, with the DFT and the MCA and so on. So it came to me. What I did, I, I, I did a, an assessment of the potential impact looking at the effects of earlier uh, environmental legislation on, on fuels and, and ships and boats operations. Um, and uh, in particular, we looked at the situation um, where large ships have had to change to uh, lower sulfur fuels and the issues that there have been and the breakdowns and the navigational incidents that have occurred. And we then thought, well, these sorts of things might occur with this change, might, please. Um, so we then wrote a, a stiff letter to the new Minister for Shipping, who was delighted, of course, because it joined the similarly stiff letter that had gone in from the Passenger Boat Association, the National Work Boat Association, uh, Professional Boatmen and the Company of Watermen and Lightermen. And we were basically flagging up the same thing. A, you need to talk to us, and B, we need to have a serious think about this and what, and what the uh, implications are. And we'll hear more of that today, okay? So I'm not going to try and cover all of it. Um, we've got other expert speakers to talk about that. But the key points that we saw um, were engine operability on this new fuel in pure terms. Will the engines work? Uh, fuel system problems that there might be of various sorts, and we'll hear some more about that. The crucial thing about fuel storage and use, because that is where our industry chain is very different from the land side, be you a farmer or a, uh, another land type operator. And then of course the crucial thing of fuel availability and price, and we'll hear some more about that later today. So why is this happening to me? Well David's already run through much of that. Um, it's, it's for a good reason. It is part of the objective of reducing our overall pollution, uh, air emissions, into the atmosphere from the use of largely diesel engines. Um, so that's why the EU directive comes around. There are new generations of engines being developed, and many of our engine manufacturers uh, represented here and others are very much involved in developing engines to meet the new uh, Euro 4, Euro 5 levels of legislation, which map across to the US uh, regulations as well. And the aim is to reduce even further the levels of uh, sulfur and nitrous oxides and particulates in the exhaust gas, something that anyone traveling through London uh, has experience of. Um, so it's, it's all got a good cause. And the problem is that if you have sulfur in the fuel and therefore in the exhaust, that sulfur would blind the catalysts that are necessary to meet these higher levels of, uh, of uh, exhaust cleaning. So there's a good reason for it, but we've got to be able to carry on our business, haven't we? 
So we've heard about the, uh, this term NRMM, non-road mobile machinery, and Europe recognizes that that uh, covers tractors and generators, um, well, mobile generators, and, uh, but it also covers inland waterways vessels. And this definition is being looked at by not only, the, well, the DFT, but in consultation with the representative of industry. We've had two meetings already. We've got a final meeting uh, on this coming Friday. So feedback from today's session is going to be really useful to help uh, us persuade um, the DFT that there are a large number of people affected by this. And. Um, but we have got the benefit, we as operators have got the benefit of experience of the road industry where um, ultra low sulfur diesel has been in use for two to three years already. We've all been using it in our cars. I drive an old Vauxhall which has got a two and a half litre BMW engine in. It's 10 years old. The engine was developed years before that. It hasn't given up and it hasn't suddenly started leaking all over the place. So, you know. Our, our key anxiety, uh, we, we really should be um, sort of slightly reassured, but the other issues do remain. Well, what vessels might this directive affect? And I apologize for uh, the sort of large number of PLA pictures here and London pictures, but it affects, it could affect all of these types of vessels, pilot boats, patrol boats, other, other work boats operating um, in our uh, estuaries and, and in our rivers, and of course, vessels on what other people, a layperson, might recognize as an inland waterway. Not just the narrow boats in the leisure market, but, but charter boats and all sorts of other types of vessel, with engines ranging from very small single cylinder engines up to really quite large uh, engines in the passenger boats and, uh, and, and in vessels that are operating up and down our larger waterways. But it very much depends upon what this definition of at sea or to sea is. Um, so it's, in, it, it's kind of important that we, uh, we get that clarified. Because until it's clarified, the fuel suppliers don't know how big their market is going to be. And so how much of this stuff to make and how much of ships marine gas oil to make. Ships marine gas oil, as we'll learn a little bit later, is made to a different standard but it's still, to you and me, looks like red diesel. So we need to finalize that discussion with the DFT and then be able to pass that information out so that our people and our fuel suppliers and so on can, uh, can all get themselves as best prepared we can before 1st of January. I mentioned fuel, so uh, what exactly is red diesel? We all know that it's diesel that we shouldn't put in our cars. And there are those chaps who come along and try and catch us when we do, or if we do. Um, and what's happening? But there's a bit more to it than that. So there's going to be a bit of technical stuff here. Um, more in my next talk, I'm afraid. So uh, you know, that's the time for a bit of a snooze if you want to. There are various standards, specifications for red diesel. The top one is a British standard and that is a fuel oil for agricultural, domestic and industrial engines and boilers. There are two classes. One is for automotive distillate, <coughs> i.e. stuff that moves, non-road uh, mobile machinery, and then a, a middle distillate for stationary engines. Actually in practice, they only make one. And because the largest market is for the class A2, that's what they make. And you might go along and say, well, I've got a generator and I only need class D. They'll say, here's some fuel that will work in your, it's made to class D. It's actually class A2 stuff, okay? Um, just the size of the market and the need for bunkers and tanks and all the rest of it means that there's only so much uh, that can be made. Now, class A2 is, is pretty much the same as your road d'oeuvre, okay? Uh, but it has the red dye in it simply to indicate that it is um, for use uh, off-road. So the road diesel BSEN 590 is pretty similar uh, to, to the A2 stuff, okay? Underneath there's another fuel, BS ISO 8217 Petroleum Products Class F. 
category DMA. Now, those of us who've been to sea and uh, come into harbour and draw down some stuff called marine gas oil, this is what we use, okay? It's used in big ships for use in their harbour generators. Very similar stuff is used by the Royal Navy as DZO, F-76, um, in, uh, in, in, to propel uh, Royal Navy's ships, okay? Now, up until to this year, the Class A-2 and the DMA stuff was pretty much the same, okay? It's red diesel. Um, it had a thousand parts per million uh, or 0.1% uh, sulfur and it didn't have any bio content. What's happened this year is that the two standards have moved away from each other and that the BS2869, your tractor oil if you like, um, has moved to become the less than 10 parts per million and has introduced a biofuel content of up to 7%. So um, that's, that's the sort of stuff that uh, we can use in our land plant uh, and, and it's the stuff, sort of stuff that we may well get for our inland waterways vessels. However, ships are not covered by this directive and I suspect that they will still want to be able to draw down uh, BSO 8217 category D DMA. We don't know whether they'll be able to get it in the UK. That rather depends on the market. But that standard at to, uh, in the 2010 will remain at 1,000 parts per million sulfur and will have no biofuel content. Okay, That's kind of important to remember. And so the definition of to see is really, really important, and we'll be talking to the um, Department of Transport on Friday uh, to try and get this clarified, okay? We'll be hearing more about these standards, so you know we don't need any questions on that. There's a, there's a specialist coming to talk to us. So the fundamental question is, will my engines work on this stuff, okay? The answer is yes. Diesels are fairly robust beasts, and um, they'll, they'll burn their own lube oil, given a chance. Uh, and we've had a few uh, bits of fun with that sort of thing going on. Um, but why do we, how do we know? When we first engaged with the DFT, we asked, well, what trials have been done? And at the time, back in June, July, they weren't aware, or the people we were talking to weren't aware, but they, bless them, they, they dug around, and they came out with two sets of important information. One. Uh, a series of trials undertaken by the rail industry uh, that the Rail Strategic Safety Board is a central company that now uh, deals with all these sorts of issues for the rail industry and they sponsored some trials that ran from 2006 to 2008. Um, the Rhine vessels um, have a, a, a sort of an insuring organization called IVR and they've got a technical department and they ran some trials in 2007 and of course, we've all been burning it in our, um, in our cars and trucks and so on since 2007. There have been some issues. I'm not pretending that there haven't been, and we'll be hearing some experience of that uh, later on today. But fundamentally, your engine will work from an operability perspective. There are other issues uh, about which I'll be talking later and we'll hear more further on. So the RSSB trials. These were undertaken both on the test bed and on the track and they were quite extensive. Um, the trials on the track were actually not operational trains, they weren't just test pieces running up and down the track. They used a wide range of locomotives with engines of various sizes and manufacturers but all principally four-stroke high-speed diesel engines which is what we use in the uh, in, in, our, in our sector of the uh, maritime industry. The larger engines on the test bed were Paxman Valentas, similar in size and power to the MTU units used, for example, in the Thames Clipper vessels, okay, on, here on the Thames. The smaller engines in, uh, included the Cummins LT10, which is 250 horsepower, quite typical size of engine to a, a, to a um, uh, workboat. Uh, and the Cummins NTA 855R3, 400 horsepower, and the Perkins 2006 TWH 
which is a 350 horsepower engine. And they sort of drive these sorts of things uh, down at the bottom. The Valentas are in on the right-hand side and the, and the Perkins and so on are in the motor, motor units on the left. And in the center there, you see um, the Cummins LT10. So it's very typical of the sort of engine that we, we use. Um, across the trial period, which was six to nine months on track, and with very considerable mileage over the tens of engines that they tried this fuel, no observable effects were identified on performance other than a slight fall off in fuel consumption in some cases. The nitrous oxide, sulfur oxide and particulate uh, exhaust emissions were recorded as lower than with uh, a conventional low sulfur fuel. Okay, So there's, there's an environmental benefit uh, and they didn't have any particular breakdowns. Okay, so that was the RSSB's recommendations. And the full report can be downloaded. Um, the, uh, we, we've got some data on, on that, uh, and it's included in, in the uh, link should be included in your package of information. If we move on to the Rhine insurers, this organization called IVR, what they used was um, uh, an EN590, i.e. road diesel, it doesn't carry the big duty that we, uh, we have to pay over here. Um, so it, it, uh, it gave a, a cleaner burning characteristics than typical red diesel, and it offered better lubricity characteristics, so there were no problems within the, um, within the fuel injection system. Um, so that's some good news. Um, however, they highlighted that there is a risk of seal sinkage and subsequent fuel weepage, something that the DFT has, has, has flagged up and, and other people we've spoken to. And they considered uh, that the oil total base number, the alkalinity of the oil, would need to be matched to this new fuel because of the reduction of sulfur. Sulfur increases the acidity of the uh, combustion products, if you like. Um, and they said that the engine and oil manufacturers should advise on this. Now, actually, if you look at the oils that we are using at the moment in these sorts of engines, they're typical 1040 multigrades. Um, and when you look at engines specified to um, work on an ultra low sulfur fuel, like road engines, they're also running on a 1040 multigrade. But it's probably as well to talk to your engine manufacturer, get their advice, and then talk to your oil supplier. They noted that fuel consumption may increase. Um, excuse me, that's, that should be 0.7%, not 0.27%. My typo, I for, uh, please forgive me. 0.7% um, approximately, where biofuel is added due to its lower calorific value. But of course, it very much depends on the proportion of biofuel. Okay, um, And there may be more difficulty with separating water out where biofuel is added into the mix because of the, um, because of the, the uh, hydroscopic nature of, uh, of the fatty acid uh, the type bi biofuels. But they were trialed in vessels like this, as we see at the bottom, and that's a, a Yanmar engine in the middle there that is typical of uh, one of the Rhine installations. So what do we need to do as marine operators, or indeed for those who are surveyors, um, in advising our clients um, when, when, they've, when they've heard about this and they're anxious? Well, those of us who are involved in the consultation, and we have representatives of work boats, uh, the, the boat operators themselves, the passenger boat uh, trade, um, the ports and, uh, and pilotage authorities and various others involved with the DFT, first of all, we need to get the best delineation of inland. That will help us in deciding what we need to do. It will also help the fuel industry who are at the moment in limbo because they do not know the size of their market. And that's why we need to go and have uh, sensible talks with our suppliers to make sure that they can keep us provided, uh, but more of that later. 
Uh, we, made, we need to make arrangements um, with our fuel suppliers for the best fuel for our needs once we know that definition. Either the ultra-low sulfur fuel, which may contain biofuel, and, it, and it's a maximum, so you know, it doesn't have to have biofuel in it, and uh, we can get some advice on that. Uh, or, if we are allowed to be considered as operating at sea, will we have access to um, low sulfur ship's gas oil, the thousand parts per million stuff? And if so, then for those operating in category C and D waters, we may be okay. But more importantly, we'll need to monitor, we'll, we really need to up our game in terms of monitoring and maintaining our fuel systems and maintaining the quality of our fuel and much of that will be available to us later in the day. Uh, there are some very good presentations later in the day on that. Um, it won't be long before uh, our insurers start to be alert to this problem. And when we say, oh, I've suddenly lost 30,000 uh, uh, 30, litres of fuel um, because of microbiological contamination, they will ask us what measures we have in place to monitor and maintain the quality of our fuel, okay? So it's worth uh, not only listening for ourselves, but also um, taking note so that we'll be able to advise our clients and those who we work with. Well, I hope that the information that you gain from today's discussions helps with, all, with this whole process. Certainly the feedback that we're going to get from you is uh, we'll be able to take that through with the DFT and uh, hopefully get a, a, a successful resolution. Thank you very much.